Welcome to Philosophy 6 Logic at Las Positas College. Today we're talking about Mill's methods of causal inference. You'll find this discussion in Chapter 10.2 of your Hurley Logic textbook. It's important to remember that here we are talking about inductive confirmation. This is induction as opposed to deduction. So the premises will, in an inductive confirmation, make the conclusion more probable but the evidence is not going to be sufficient to make the conclusion necessary. Mill's methods then are traditional rules for making causal inductive inferences. The first method that we'll talk about is Mill's method of agreement. The method of agreement can be explained in this way. Among those cases where the effect occurs, if there is only one antecedent factor that those cases have in common, then that factor is likely to be the cause of the effect. Here's an example question to work through this. So imagine that we are camping at Big Sur and we find that some people woke up sick the next morning. Using the method of agreement, if I gather the sick people at camp and find they came from many places, ate many different things for dinner, and slept in different parts of the camp, and the only thing they have in common is that they drank water from the river, then we can make the conclusion an inductive inference that the river water is what caused the illness. It's the only thing that the sick people have in common. Here's a little chart to help illustrate this relationship. So some people were sick, some people were not sick. With the method of agreement, I'm not worried about those who are not sick, because I want to say among those with the effect, those who are sick, what's the one thing that they have in common? Well, it's not where they came from, because they came from all different locations. It's not what they ate, because they all ate different things. It's not where they slept, because they all slept in different parts of the camp. But when it comes to what they drank, they all drank the same thing for dinner, which was the river water. If that's all they have in common, Mill's going to say there's good evidence that that is likely to be the cause of them getting sick. The next method we'll talk about is Mill's method of difference. We could explain it by saying that if a group in which a certain effect occurs differs from the group in which it does not occur in only one attribute, attribute x, then that attribute is the cause of the effect. So if we go back to our example and say, why did the people who are sick at our camp get sick? Well, for the method of difference, I'm going to have to gather both the group that's sick and the group that is not sick. So let's say we find that the group with the effect in that group, they're the ones who got sick, and they slept at spot X, they ate food Y, they came from town Z, and they drank from the river. When we look at the group without the effect, those who were not sick, they slept in the same spot as the other group, they ate the same food as the other group that didn't get sick, they came from the same town as those who didn't get sick, but the one difference that they have from group A is that they did not drink the water. Then we have good inductive evidence that it was in fact the river water that caused the illness because that was the only antecedent condition that was different between the group that got sick and the group that did not. So here's a little diagram of what that might look like. Here's those who did not get sick. Here's those who did. Well, where did they come from? The ones who didn't get sick came from Big Sur. Where'd they come from? Those who did get sick, they came from Big Sur. It's a match. What did they eat? Franken beans for one, Franken beans for the other group. Uh, what about where they slept? Beside the ocean, beside the ocean in the same spot. What did they drink? Aha! Canteen water for those who did not get sick, river water for those who did. Looks like the river water is a likely cause of the illness. The next method that we'll talk about is the method of residues. We could explain it thus. When you have a phenomenon with many causes, you can separate out the effects of the known causes, and what is left is likely caused by your remaining cause. So let's assume that in this case, we wanted to know how much of the tiredness and fatigue of the sick campers was caused by their illness. Well, if there was some way to separate out the other factors making them tired, like the long hike and sleeping on the ground, 
then perhaps the remaining fatigue is due to the illness. So the effect that we're trying to explain here is the degree of the fatigue. But we know that campers are likely to get fatigued by more than just being sick. Campers are likely to go hiking, they're likely to sleep on the ground, and these things cause fatigue as well. So when we're looking at the overall fatigue, if we want to know how much of the fatigue comes from the illness, then we have to subtract out the other causes of fatigue, and the amount of fatigue left is the amount that's likely to be caused by the illness rather than by the other factors. You may have noticed that we skipped method three. Method three is the method of similarities and differences, combining those two together to make a causal inference. I decided to skip that section because we get, I think, most of what we need from considering the two methods independently. So method three, the method of similarity and difference, that one you can ignore. The final method we will talk about from Mill then is the method of a concomitant variation. We can describe the method thus. When one factor, we'll call it x, changes to a certain degree, and another factor y changes to a relative degree. In this situation, we have some evidence that x is a causal factor relative to y. So let's go back to that original question. We're trying to understand the illness of our campers and understand how and why they got sick. And let's assume that we observed this. Those who drank a little bit of water, they had stomach aches. It was mild and not too bad. Those who drank a full cup of water, they had cramps and fevers, really didn't feel well. And those who went so far as refilling their entire canteen at the river got so sick they had to go to the hospital. In this case, we can see that with each increment of water that the campers drank, they got an increasing amount of illness. So it appears that the amount of illness increases along with the amount of consumption of water. Hence, it looks like water is the cause of the illness. So here's a chart of what this might look like. If we're looking at the cups of water consumed and the severity of the illness, and we find that these go together. One cup of water consumed has an illness index, let's say, of 1 in severity. Two cups of water consumed, an illness index of 2. Three cups of water consumed, the illness continues to increase. And at 4, the illness is at its maximum. The two conditions, drinking water and the illness, are varying together. We could explain the same relationship with the line graph. Let's assume that one of our axes here is a measure of how many cups of water each camper drank the night before. The other axis is a measure of the degree of illness for that same camper. And we end up with measurement showing that at each increment of water that was drank, the degree of severity of the illness increases as well. Drawing a trend line, we can see that the two are correlated. It looks like good evidence that the previous instance of drinking water was in fact the causal explanation for why the illness occurred. So I hope this discussion helps you to understand some of Mill's methods of causal inference. These understandings will be useful as you make your way through the assignments for this week.